Hey guys, we're going to go through a derivation here that is related to your data. And basically the goal here is that you understand <coughs> this process of linearization. I feel like we got to the end of class and we're covering that a little bit quickly. So I wanted to put this in video form so you have it in a place that you can always go back to and check on um, your understanding of it. Really important concept here. It takes time to, to master. Um, it'll be something we do throughout the year constantly. Um, so, so definitely save this uh, video in a place that you can always go back to it. What I'll do is that this video will be attached to the email and then in the email I'm going to place in it a problem that you can try that is related to this concept and then tomorrow we'll really get into some problem solving um, with this as our, our sort of way of thinking about accelerated motion. One of the really cool parts about this graph and uh, about the data you all took is that this graph and data are directly connected to clearly an accelerating object, something that falls on Earth, and it's producing this data that is very, very clear, and it's from this that we can kind of backwards, take a step backwards and, and say, this is how all objects that accelerate move, and there are some specifics to different scenarios, of course, but, but we can have this very specific idea of like how accelerating objects work versus, say, a constant velocity object. So let's dive into it a little bit, walk through, and um, see if we can clear up some of this um, confusion. This is one of my favorite, favorite things um, that happens in physics, is, is the ability to look at data, and from that data, be able to make physical, mathematical reasoning. So let's look at it. This is the graph that you guys produced, basically. Um, has this shape and form, and I asked you to plot this again, but squaring the time, to give you a different graph. And I'm going to address that in a minute, but I want to talk about why I knew to do that. Why well, I look at this graph and I ask myself, well, gosh, it's not linear. If it was linear, I'd be able to make a function out of this, the one that looks like y equals mx plus b. It's not that. So I got to step back and say, well, what functional family do I think this could fit? And if you look at this, it does look like a couple different kinds of functions. It could definitely be a quadratic, um, something to the squared power or any number of order of magnitudes up from that, um, to the cube power, to the fourth power. It also could be exponential in its form. It has that in increasing exponential look to it. Um, so what I do is I make a prediction to say, well, I think it's going to have a certain form. Let's go with a quadratic of the second order and see if that works. I know that quadratics of the second order look like the following. So if I wrote it out, it'd be x equals, or, sorry, y rather, y equals a times x squared plus b times x plus c, where a, b, and c are coefficients, uh, constants. That's what a quadratic looks like. So in this special case where the x uh, intercept or the y intercept is 0, that graph looks like this, y equals ax squared. So in that case, this goes to 0, and we get a graph that looks like this. So if you graph y equals something times x squared, you get something that looks like this. You know that from math class, from pre-calculus. What we're going to do is this. We're going to say, well, if that's true, given, it, let's assume this function, this graph, the data, the real data that you took, follows this form. If that's true, that means this. If I were to take my x data and I were to square that data, by squaring that data, I'm basically doing this operator. I'm, I'm making that part of my data. So I'm saying square it. If that's the case, what happens, and I plot this on the x-axis, what happens is I get something that looks like y equals some number times this thing that's going on my x-axis. So let's talk about that translation again, because this is, this is the, where, the, where the most of the work is. I'm arguing that if we were to go ahead and square this va variable, which is our x-axis, which is what you did here, if that's the case, and I'm plotting it as x squared, then it just becomes whatever my x variable is on the x-axis. And if that's the case, this looks very familiar to me. y equals something times x what well, we usually call that m, where the m is the slope. And what we have here is y-intercept form. 
So this process here of going from here to here is what we call linearization. The gist of the idea is this. If I have a suspicion that a graph of data fits a certain curve, if I play that operator out on one of those variables so that I can turn it into what would be a linear function, I can then plot that data, x versus t squared instead of x versus t. If I plot that, if it comes out to be linear, I'm confirming that this was true. So when you guys did that, you ended up with very linear functions, which meant that this idea of the squared quadratic is actually what this data fits. So if that's the case, I can treat this like y equals mx plus b. y equals mx plus b. I'm not going to write plus b because for this graph it was zero. You guys said that um, there's no time passing when the objects travel no distance. That makes physical sense. If that's the case, now what I do is I translate from this graph what those values are. And for me, this is the part that helped me understand what happened here. So watch what I do and see if this helps you clarify some points. So my y variable, just like we did for constant velocity motion, my y variable is x, as in the x final position. Slope, I might not know exactly what it is yet, but I can certainly measure it off of this graph. So we're gonna, let's just call it m for the moment. And then x, my x variable here is t squared. And so instead of writing x, I'm going to write t squared. And so we get a function that has the form x equals m times t squared. So if we check to see if that makes sense, it would say that as time goes on, this value is getting squared, making the distance traveled bigger and bigger and bigger by increasing steps each time, which matches what our intuition says. As objects speed up, we should see them travel further each time. So since that is the case, I end up with this equation, which is the form of the equation for accelerating objects. Now it turns out it's a, in a very general um, equation, and we can get to this by analyzing a little bit of the units. In fact, we can do that right now. Um, if we wanted to figure out what the m is, well, we would say the following. Well, m for this graph would be slope, which is rise over run. So m here would be m equals this, which would be measured in, I'm going to work with the units right now. So this will be m measured in meters over s squared meters per second squared. The slope of this line has the units of meters per second squared. And so if you ask yourself, well, what other unit has meters per second squared, that unit turns out to be the acceleration. So this m has units of acceleration. The way this actually will come out is x equals 1 half times acceleration times t squared. And that's the equation of motion for an object dropped from rest in free fall. That's how we get it through the process of linearization figured out. So for any object dropped like the object you had in your lab, if you use this equation of motion, you can figure out what the acceleration is if you know how far it went and what the time of fall turns out to be. The interesting bit here is that this number for falling objects is one that we can know as a constant and so we'll look into that a little bit tomorrow. Um, and actually in the problem I give you to try this evening that involves this, um, it will use a certain acceleration. The full form of this equation, I'm just going to go ahead and show it to you, and then we can talk more about it tomorrow. The full form of the equation for objects that are not necessarily dropped at rest looks like this. x equals x naught plus v naught t plus 1 half a t squared. And you can see the quadratic right there and right there. There's the squared, there's the single term. So 1 half times a would be the coefficient there. The original speed would be the coefficient here. And the original position would be the coefficient here. This will actually end up being our full equation of motion for objects that fall, uh, well, not just fall, any object that has an acceleration. So um, feel free to watch that video again and walk through the explanations. Feel free to come back to me with questions that you have. Um, on, on understanding where that equation comes from. We will master that process of linearization over the course of the year and um, definitely become more complex mathematical thinkers as we look at the physical world. 
follow up with the uh, question that's asked in the homework on the uh, email. Bring that back with your notes tomorrow. We'll have a chance to talk about this, but we're more importantly going to dive into some reasoning and problem solving with these equations. All right, have a good evening.